Welcome to the Holocaust Museum and Cohen Education Center Teachers Workshop Series on Genocide. This is session five. Session five is titled Once Yugoslavia, and it is going to focus on the period after Tito's death in 1980, all the way through almost till present. My name is Sam Parrish. It's my pleasure, my honor to, to be um, offering up this teacher's workshop. Teacher's workshop is obviously for teachers of all types, whether that be uh, homeschool, private, uh, alternative, public school, religious school, or otherwise. It's for anyone who's interested or who has someone who they teach. It's also for people who are interested in general. Um, this is going to probably be a long video. So what I'm going to do is on the YouTube description of the video, I will have listed the different countries and the different time segments. So Slovenia will start at such and such and end at such and such. So if you're interested specifically in an area, as opposed to the whole Balkans area, you can find that and eliminate a lot of, uh, a lot of time anyway. You're of course encouraged and welcome to attend the whole, the whole um, video, however long it ends up being. Uh, again, this is session five, obviously following session four. Session four was on Yugoslavia during World War II. And so we're going to see connections, direct connections from World War II to uh, what took place in the beginning after Tito's death and all the way through to practically to, to, to today. Um, as, as we always do, I'd like to thank the um, Florida Task Force for their support, um, the Florida Task Force on Holocaust Education for their support um, as well as the Merrill Color uh, Educator Series for their support as well. So that allows this uh, museum to offer teachers workshops. Traditionally, we've done in person. Now we're doing all remote. These are therefore accessible anytime a teacher or other is interested in, in looking at it. So um, it's, it's located obviously where you, where you found it on uh, our museum's website under teachers uh, workshops. And then this is session five. Inside that folder, you'll find the activities that I reference and you'll find some links as well. So generally I try to do that for each session. So session fours has the same thing. It has the PowerPoint and um, activities and the like. This workshop, like the previous four, um, is dealing with genocide and human rights, uh, mass human rights atrocities, and therefore obviously is graphic in nature. Uh, the PowerPoint isn't as graphic as some of them have been in the past, but still there's a warning, um, a warning for the general nature of what we're talking about. Genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and ethnic cleansing. So that's what we'll be focusing on. And along the way, when we come across a country and an incident such as one of those, I'll try to point it out. Uh, the second thing that we're going to do is to, at least a couple times using genocidewatch.com's 10 stages of genocide, which was created by uh, Dr. Stanton. Um, I will try to point that out where they think, for example, like a Bosnia is today, um, where, where Kosovo or Serbia or others might be today. So that's what we're gonna look at and apply those two things. Um, that'd be the, the UN definitions and Stanton's 10 stages of genocide. All right, I think for in general, to, to start, we need to begin with the death of Tito, Marshal Tito, Joseph, Joseph Brooks, um, May 4, 1980. We will see an activity that's based entirely on the personage of Tito, and that'll be coming up. It's, it's, in, the, uh, it's in the session five folder, but I'll go over a little bit of, of the description of how I think the activity could go. I think it could actually be pretty interesting. And it is based on Tito and his, his strength of character, his personality and how he was able to hold together such a disparate gathering of people um, and under one label that was Yugoslavia. We talked in session four about how, about the makeup of what was called Yugoslavia, how different the people were um, ethnically, culturally, religiously, linguistically, that includes different alphabets, um, their orientation, whether it was a Western or Eastern orientation, um, not to mention noting um, historic animus, I mean, long standing. And then the, the two, the one that comes to mind is Serbia, Croatia, Croatia, Serbia, 
Um, and we will see how we can bring that forward from world, the World War II period um, where Serbs and Croats um, were engaged as much with one another as they were in um, against the Nazis and the Italians and the Hungarians and the others who were uh, who were occupying um, what was then Yugoslavia. So Tito's death is our starting point, May 4, 1980. After his death, and this is a kind of a, a crude expression, but almost before his body had cooled, um, the tensions that had been kept under wraps since 1945, they had been, must have been bubbling right there underneath the surface. Then they started to have fissures or chinks in the armor of the country of Yugoslavia, and they were able to start emerging. And so, so we will see that in various ways in various places. We'll start with Slovenia because uh, it is the first country that decides to separate itself from Yugoslavia by declaring independence. Um, it was one month after Tito's death that um, some Slovenian intellectuals got together and discussed the concept of free debate. Tito had run the country as a communist, communist government um, with a nationalist kind of um, sensibility. So nationalist communism, I guess we could call it, um, which certainly wouldn't have allowed free debate. So intellectuals were pushing for that almost um, a month. So that was a little exaggeration, but about a month after Tito's death. There was a concert that followed um, about solidarity with Poland during Poland's period. Um, and that will, we will see that in an activity that I'll describe later on. We'll see the idea of concerts, uh, of bringing people together and the role that musicians and artists and others play. And, um, and then we'll compare, we'll compare that to other times, including ours today. So there was a concert that was held, a solidarity concert that was held in February of 1982. There was also an alternative journal. So now we have, um, we have free debate sought. We have um, free association with a concert. Uh, we have solidarity outside of this country, Yugoslavia. And this alternative journal, um, which is considered the beginning of democratization there, and um, certainly is a step in the direction of freedom of speech. So you can see there must have been this yearning that was right there, held together by Tito, quelled by Tito, and as soon as he passed, it rose to the top, right, almost right away. Um, there, there was a gathering of more intellectuals, 26 intellectuals to be exact, and they demanded changes in the Constitution explicitly to support and protect freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. So you can see these movements were, were there. Um, there was an interesting thing called the Venetic Theory, V-E-N-E-T-I-C, the Venetic Theory that was launched by a, an historian. And it stated that Slovenes, people from Slovenia, um, were not South Slavs. In session four, we talked about the meaning of Yugo, Slavia, as being the land of the South Slavs. Here we have this new theory coming out in 1980-ish, um, that was saying that the, that the Slovenes who were part of Yugoslavia were actually not South Slavs. Um, we also saw a, a similar thing in Croatia during World War II where the Croats uh, positioned themselves as a race more like the German Aryan race. So that idea is, is replicated all these years later, granted in Slovenia. Um, of course, that idea of them not being South Slavs was seen by Yugoslavians and the others who made up the country of Yugoslavia as being anti-Yugoslavia. But it did gain in popularity um, over the years um, because it kind of had this mystical idea that they were the last remnant of this original uh, European people, the Veneti, possibly with, with a, a connection to Italy since Italy was, was right there on the border. Um, let's see if we have a on the map here. Yeah, you can see, you can see uh, 
Italy here, granted it's cut off, um, up to here and Slovenia. So maybe that's where this idea of the Veneti uh, came from. Anyway, this idea that they were somehow different and that was also supportive of their idea of separating themselves through a uh, declaration of independence, which we'll see in a bit. We'll fast forward to April of, April of 1986. There was a League of Socialist Youth of Slovenia and they met and they, they were pushing ideas that we, we often associate especially with young people, but not entirely, um, environmental issues, issues and rights uh, for homosexuals, um, this general idea of human rights, or rather, uh, yeah, of human rights, but also this idea of pacifism. Um, they also were pushing more for freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, and also the right to strike. That certainly wouldn't have been allowed during uh, Tito's reign. More alternative journals uh, promoted independence over the years. So now we're 86, 87, they're promoting these ideas of independence and democracy. Um, different political parties were formed. The Independent Social Democrat Party of Slovenia was formed in 1987. In 1988, there was an alternative Slovenian constitution that was proposed uh, by academics. Um, and also interestingly, the Slovenian Peasant Union formed. We'll see other peasant union forms um, in different countries that are still within Yugoslavia at this point. Uh, the formation of that Slovenian peasant union is considered to be the beginning of the Slovenian spring. And we hear that expression, we think, so where have I heard that before? It's the Arab spring. So that's an activity idea right there is to look into the Arab spring, the Slovenian spring, and doing a, a, compare, and, a compare and contrast on that. Um, more details of that to follow, but that's an idea that that we could connect history to closer to today, and then actually to today in our lives to make to make history relevant for students. Anyway, uh, a couple of years after um, or a year after the this constitution was proposed, uh, the so uh, the Slovenian Democrat uh, Democratic Union was formed. In 1989, the Slovenian Democrat Union was formed. The Social Democratic Union of Slovenia was formed. The Slovene Christian Social Movement was formed and the Greens of Slovenia were formed along with uh, the Democrat opposition uh, of Slovenia formed. So you have all these different political parties. Interestingly, you will see that um, a lot of this was socialism, social demo democracy, social Democrats. Um, that were, um, were forming um, as they were vying for independence. So it's kind of interesting. The Slo Slovenians actually amend their constitution and it includes in their specific constitution, it includes the concept of secession. So they've got this idea now, it's, it's really percolating to the top. They've now injected this idea of secession because they can, they can sense that it's coming. Interestingly, despite all these socialist uh, political parties that are formed, the country officially drops the word socialist from the Republic's official name. Uh, Slovenia refused, however, to allow Serbians and Montenegrins into its capital of Ljubljana. I, oh yes, I'm glad I said that. I will undoubtedly make uh, mistakes in pronunciation, especially um, especially in this session. There's a lot of names that are just are difficult, and unfamiliar. Some are familiar. Slobodan Milosevic is a name that um, we'll hear, and it's one that I recall growing up. I heard that in the news. Slobodan Milosevic. It was an easy name to say now because I'd heard it so much. But some of these others are difficult. So if I make mistakes, apologies. It's certainly not intentional. All right. So in response to this ban that um, of protests. Serbia, a separate country now, Slovenia, the country of Serbia, who we will play, we will see plays a massive role throughout this this whole uh, this whole Balkans war period, this independence period, and so forth. Serbia, once again, like they did during World War II, plays a huge role. So, in in response to Slovenia banning protests, saying Serbs and Montenegrins are not allowed in our capital to protest. The Serbs, the country of Serbia, begins an economic blockade. Slovenia and Serbia were opposition forces during World War II, during the occupation. And this is 
the first, but certainly not the last time that I will say that this is a revival of World War II animus, but really that World War II animus was a revival of World War I and before that. So we are, revolving, we are reviving um, ancient hatreds. So now we're, we're still in 1989. Um, the Slovene opposition and a writer's associate, association write this joint manifesto that's called the May Declaration. Um, and it demands democratic, uh, a democratic Slovene nation state. So this is all these different ways of saying we want out of Yugoslavia. Once again, reviving that idea of the, these World War II animuses. Um, in January of 90, now we're up to 1990, when the, the Yugoslavian defense minister requested increased military personnel in Slovenia. So the JNA, JNA is the Yugoslavian National Army. The JNA created a, a plan of action for territories that had ethnically mixed populations like Bosnia and Herzegovina um, and Croatia. So now we see the entrance of this, of this Serb dominated army, which was the national army for the country of Yugoslavia. So you can already see kind of a partitioning. If, if only, if only a, a, an intellectual or psychic or mental uh, partitioning, once again, of Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia. These forces are once again separating from one another. All right, anyway, in March of 1990, there was the meeting of the League of Communists of Yugoslavia, the whole country, and it excluded members from Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Slovenia, and then down into Macedonia. So this is already separating and almost dividing up the forces because we will see that Serbia and Montenegro are aligned and eventually Yugoslavia is only comprised of Serbia and Montenegro. So those forces are separated. Um, the Slovenia Democratic Opposition issues a proposal uh, for a, a, an updated constitution, which once again is hinting at independence. And then finally in June of 1991, Slovenia declares independence. Well, you can imagine that the Serb dominated JNA, Yugoslavia National Army, lashes out first in Slovenia. So two days after that declaration, now we're up to June 27 of 1991, um, the 10-day war begins. This is one of at least three named wars that I'll mention along the way too. That could be some sort of activity to um, identify the various named wars that took place, um, if only in the Balkans. Anyway, the 10-day war began, not lasting very long, right? Lasting 10 days. And that pitted the um, Slovenian military versus the JNA, the Yugoslavian National Army. And it ends on June 6. And that's followed by the Brioni Agreement. <clears throat> so I'm uh, not getting into the Brioni Agreement. But what's interesting is that some of the, of the written material, the scholarship that I saw, references ethnic, this is in quotes, so this is not, I'm not saying this, ethnic homogeneity as being the cause for a relatively short-lived um, war of fighting and a low number of deaths. So we're seeing this ethnic homo homogeneity um, being credited with keeping this war relatively short and, and, and as casualty free as possible. Whether that's true or not re would require, I think, years, years of research. But it's interesting and it brings up a point for a daring, um, a daring activity to be done with students. Daring, gutsy, uh, controversial for sure, could be explosive as well. So this is something that you would want to do with trepidation. You would want approval if, if this is a uh, a school environment where you report to someone. Um, I wouldn't recommend it for all students. I think you'd have to make sure you select certain classes, not sure which ones, but you would so select certain classes that could handle this. These are not my words, but this is the daring idea 
based on this idea of ethnic homogeneity being um, allegedly the um, credited with keeping the war short and the and casualties down. We all know the expression diversity is our strength. What if we turn that on, on its head and challenge students to take most likely the opposite view? Conventional wisdom turned on its head. I mean, after all, if we're teaching students and we're, we're supposed to be looking for um, critical thinking skills, that's an expression that's used all the time. Okay, let's do that. Let's challenge the students to take the opposite view of what they probably would. I think most students today would say, yes, diversity is our strength. Let's challenge them to instead argue that diversity is not our strength. <clears throat> now that's, again, against conventional wisdom, contemporary thought. This would get students to think critically and to not imitate us, to not regurgitate what we're saying. I tell you that diversity is our strength. The student says diversity is our strength. Instead, we teach them to think for themselves. More than likely, um, I don't want to bias this, but more than likely they will come to the conclusion that diversity is our strength, but by arguing that diversity is not our strength. I think, you know, this is certainly not for everybody for sure. Um, so as you get into this idea of it, you know, we have to look and say, well, first off, was Slovenia that homogenous? We would have to define homogenous. Um, and then we would have to look at the various political parties that were in there. Yes, there were a lot of political parties that seemed to have the same, uh, the same leaning. Socialist was in the name of quite a few. Um, is that homogeneity? Possibly. Again, this would be something to really think about looking into, but it could be an interesting, interesting activity. And we've certainly got more activities along the way that, um, that I referenced with the, uh, the, the concert in, uh, in Poland and the Slovenian Spring. So Slovenia might be a place to look into. Certainly a place to look into is what we'll talk about next, which is Croatia. So one thing I think that was pretty obvious when we did that very quick look at Slovenia um, was really a lack of violence that I mentioned. Um, I, didn't, I didn't note genocide or any of the other mass human rights violations, crimes against humanity, war crimes, or ethnic cleansing. Slovenia was the first country to declare independence, and it was done in a relatively, uh, relatively clean way we will see differences now as we get into Croatia. And then once we get into Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, um, we, will, we won't really touch too much on Macedonia, Montenegro, but um, there's plenty of material um, just, just with uh, what I just mentioned. So, so Slovenia, relatively quiet, uh, considering it was a, a, a a movement for independence and considering that Serbia insinuated itself into the situation with the economic blockade um, and that the Yugoslavian National Army was involved. Now we'll look at Croatia. Croatia, who we saw um, in World War II, was the country that uh, produced the Ustasi, who were aligned with the Nazis and the Italians. We'll actually see echoes of that once again, at least according to the Serbs. So we will also see that age old animus, that feud between Croatia and Serbia. The Croatian, this issue pitted the Croatian military and Serbian civilians living within Croatia. Again, we're talking about ethnic mixes. We'll see if Bosnia and Herzegovina incredibly diverse um, Croatia diversity for sure. So we will see that there are uh, obviously Croats and there are Serbs. We will touch on ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing is of the four UN definitions. Ethnic cleansing is the one that's not legally accepted, but we have a, an idea of what, it, of what it is. And we will see examples that, that fulfill that albeit not, not legally accepted definition. So the, once again, I mentioned that the Serb army was dominated 
uh, Serb, that the Serbs dominated the Yugoslavian army. And the second place that that JNA, the Yugoslavian National Army lashes out after Slovenia is Croatia. There are thousands of people who are killed during this, during this situation with Croatia. Um, there actually is a pause. It begins in 1991. There's a pause in 1992 under a UN ceasefire. The United Nations will become the uh, fodder for another possible student activity. All right, so we're actually looking, for, so that there was this pause in 1992. Let's just go up to 1995 for a second. In August of 1995, the Croat army stormed areas in Croatia. Those were areas that were under control of the Serbs and they ended up forcing thousands of them to flee. They, they fled down through, um, through Bosnia, Bosnia Herzegovina. That displacement of people is war crimes. They're forcing people from their homes and their homeland um, and displacing them. So that is, a, that is an example of war crimes. So we, we, we will see ethnic cleansing and war crimes here in, in our, our look at Croatia. So let's go back to the beginning of, of when this movement for independence really began to percolate. In May of 1989, the Croatian Social Liberal Union was formed, as was the Croatian Democratic Union. So just like in Slovenia, you had the formation of new political parties. They'd finally shed the one party rule of Tito and the communists, and now they were able to express themselves however they wanted to. In Slovenia, we saw a lot of socialist leaning parties. Here we have the Croatian social, uh, we have the Croatian democratic parties that are forming, um, and we'll see more as well. Now, the name I mentioned earlier, the name I mentioned earlier was Slobodan Milosevic, and he, a Serb, delivered a speech to two million Serbs. It's called the um, Gazimestan speech, G-A-Z-I-M-E-S-T-A-N. But what's interesting about that is that he hinted about possible future, quote, armed battles, unquote, um, yet at the same time authored this, offered this idea of equality to everyone living within Serbia, regardless of ethnicity. So delivering two kind of... Um, <clears throat> counter messages, one future war, the other everything's fine here within our confines. In August of 89, the United States actually recalled the Yugoslavian ambassador. Why? They were citing human rights abuses. As early as August of 1989, they were recognizing human rights abuses in Croatia, which were crimes against humanity. I mentioned the peasant party that was formed in Slovenia. In November of 89, there was a Croatian peasant party formed. It's interesting, this idea of a peasant party. In um, 1990, actually Valentine's Day, February 14th of 1990, the Croatian parliament passed an amendment and it allowed, this is, this is more democratization and liberalization. They allowed multi-party elections. Two days after that, the chief of the UDBA, which was Yugoslavia's uh, secret police, he stated that the political party, the HDZ, or the Croatian Democratic Union, would launch a pogrom 48 hours after their victory. Now, we, don't talk, we haven't talked about uh, of the use of propaganda or fear-mongering or um, positioning, but that sounds like it, this, is this prediction. We'll see if it comes true, but he was predicting pogroms within 48 hours after their, after their victory. Well, there was actually an attempted assassination of a Croat leader by a man of Serbian ethnicity, touching back on those World War II, World War I, and more ancient um, feuds. And so that just, that just adds to it. March of 90, they held those elections, those multi-party elections in Croatia. There was a, a meeting of the League of Communists of Yugoslavia. And again, it excluded members from Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, Slovenia, and Macedonia. So that was the one that I mentioned here in Slovenia when we discussed Slovenia real quickly. So 
this is more evidence of this separation of, of who's being separated out. The two countries, the main countries that I didn't mention were Serbia and Montenegro. And we'll see that they're, they're forming a, a union that would end up being called Yugoslavia after this version of Yugoslavia dissolved. Anyway, April 1990, President and Minister of Defense both met um, regarding the Yugoslavian National Army's readiness to engage where? In both of these countries, Slovenia and Croatia. So just like during World War II, Slovenia, Croatia versus Serbia. Now, interesting. There was a riot during a soccer match um, in May of 1990. It was between a Croat and a Serbian team. I mentioned earlier the solidarity concert with Poland that, that Slovenes held. And now here we have, as opposed to artists, we have athletes. And this is leading us to an activity that I'll mention shortly. Um, so that was in May of 1990. You had a riot during a soccer match. In June, the Yugoslavian national anthem was played at a soccer match and the national team and the national anthem were booed. So now we have the intersection of sports and politics. And where have we heard that as, of the, as I do this recording on October 22nd of 2020? Well, that brings up a, a, what I think could be a really neat idea. And that's to locate within this Yugoslavian Balkans disillusion and you could apply it to other places as well, but since we're talking about this, locate um, sports and, and art. Um, so like popular people, pop stars, artists and, and athletes, those people uh, locate issues that are related to, um, to them weaving in politics. So you could compare it to today's, our NFL football, our NBA basketball, our MLB baseball, NHL um, hockey, all of which have um, recently injected uh, politics into, into sports. Um, one we'll talk about is of Vladi Divac, who was a basketball player. He played for the Lakers and the Kings, I believe at one point, very good player, had a very good career. And we will see, um, we will see how he, a Serb, uh, exemplifies the feelings of the Serbs and the Croats to one another. But I think the idea of taking um, protest in sports throughout history, um, throughout different regions could be interesting. Um, and also um, musicians holding um, concerts and benefits for to support a political idea. Could be an interesting idea, or at least maybe the interesting genesis of an actually good idea. All right, so anyway, we're in uh, 1990, once again, just like in Slovenia, you have the word socialist drop from the country's name, that's Croatia now, drop from its name and off its flag. Um, you have, in July of 1990, you have Serbs living in Croatia now who are pushing for autonomy within the country. You have members in July, again, of 1990, members of the Croatian Conservative Party are now attacked in an eastern town. So Eastern town over here is near, somewhere near the border of Serbia. So now it's only 1990 and you've already got violence starting and it escalates from here for sure. August of 1990, Serbs living in a Croatian town actually raised barricades uh, to prevent traffic flow. And it was about representation issues so within the government, um, there was violence, tensions were rising, there were threats, there, was, um, and there were threats and a claim that they were fighting for more than just cultural language and education rights. So what else were they fighting for if they, beyond representation in politics, um, cultural rights, linguistic rights and education rights? Again, this is that World War II animus that we've talked about. The next day, the following day, a Serbian referendum in Croatia um, resulted in a 98% favorable vote 
for Serbian autonomy in Croatia. The problem is this is a Croat country um, in terms of majority. Uh, now, hearkening back to that activity that I just mentioned, August 20th of 1990, um, two things happened. The Yugoslavian military demanded that Croatia does not take action against the Serbs. Of course, the, the army we've said was Serb dominated. The second thing that happened was a FIBA basketball championship. So an international championship, um, international basketball championship series. And the man I mentioned, Vlade Divac, um, took a spectator's Croatian flag and stomped on it. That is injecting politics very much so. So I think that I think that students might connect because that is that is, albeit it's 1990, so it's a long time ago, but it's the NBA and it is still kind of a more contemporary event. So the the weaving of sports with entertainment, I think we could just call sports and music entertainment in general. So the weaving of sports and entertainment might be in, with politics might be an interesting activity idea. Well, the roadblocks continued in September of 90. Serbs set up more roadblocks, uh, Croatian villages in uh, September of 1990. Croatia ended up declaring that the Yugoslavian presidential, so overall for the whole country, the Yugoslavian presidential decision was illegal and that Croatia had to protect itself and its citizens. So you can see similar to Slovenia, um, but already with a, with a lot more physical uh, violence and rhetoric, um, they are preparing themselves to get to reach independence, but there's a roadblock literally and figuratively in the way. Between February of 1991 and March, there were threats of autonomy, there were armed conflicts in Croatia, and that was between Croats and Serbs. In fact, the first shots of the Yugoslavian wars uh, were, were fired in uh, 1991 with Serbs and Croats once again. Um, on August 25th of 1991, the 87-day siege of a city called Vukovar, V-U-K-O-V-A-R. 87-day siege began and it, it pitted the Yugoslavian National Army, the JNA, and Serbian paramilitary groups versus the Croats in that city. Paramilitary skirmished with Croats later on uh, in that month or September of 91. And they even detained some of those, some of the people that they caught, some of the prisoners, Croatian prisoners that they caught, and ended up using them later as live shields, which is a deliberate. Uh, violation of war crimes. So we see them injecting, we, we mentioned um, ethnic cleansing and war crimes, and here we're starting to see war and skirmishes, but beyond that, war crimes. Um, on October, so maybe not surprising after that event, in October of 91, Croatia declared independence. Not too long after that, in October was an event called the Gospic Massacre, G-O-S-P-I-C, uh, maybe Gospic Massacre. Anyway, this is where now Croats, so this is not to say that the Serbs were doing all the, the evil deeds. The Croats now got themselves involved in some evil deeds as well. They killed mostly Serbs of the town somewhere between 100 and 120. This is outright murder of people. So that is war crimes. And it was probably, the intent of it was probably to cleanse an area ethnically. Uh, and so we talked about it during the first session that intent is very important for determining if an event or an atrocity is genocide, war crime, crime against humanity, or even ethnic cleansing. It's the intent. What was the purpose of it? Well, these, this murder of 100 to 120 Serbians by Croats is certainly the revival of World War II animus and animus from before, but it's also a war crime and it's probably also ethnic cleansing. So, uh, so 40 Croats were then murdered two days later. 
So we see this going back and forth. And this is not, there were war deaths, but then there were deaths that were outside of war. So this is escalating. And then in fact, it escalates up to October 21st when there was a thing called the Bassin, or Batchin Massacre, B-A-C-I-N. Now the Serbs in retaliation kill somewhere around 83 Croats. And there were other massacres, uh, two more Serb massacres in November and December of 1991. So this is an escalation. Well, that brings in the United Nations, which we'll see, we'll see um, an act, a possibility for an activity. So in January of 1992, like I mentioned earlier, there was that pause, a ceasefire. It's called the Sarajevo Agreement. And that brought at least a temporary peace between Croats and Serbs, Croatia and Serbia. The, the takeaway of this Sarajevo agreement is that 10,000 United Nations soldiers arrived, protection forces. 10,000 members of United Nations protection forces arrived. Well, they set up, um, they set themselves up these protection forces in three areas around Croatia. And it brings up, it brings up an activity idea. How effective is the, or are United Nations protective forces to in, in preventing physical atrocities? Are they more, as the United Nations, as a deterrent, are they better through agreements and resolutions? Is that maybe a better area for them? So to the consideration of the United Nations, where do they stand? How effective have they been historically since they've been formed? Um, they came out during World War II. So you can position it as the United Nations. Are they, are they a good offensive force that could come in to prevent physical atrocities? Are they better at, um, at offering resolutions, political, uh, diplomatic agreements? Or are they maybe more uh, justice oriented after the fact? Well, anyway, so we've got the United Nations now involved. We are looking at massacres and now we have the Croats. So this is going back and forth, tit for tat with Croatia and, Ser and Serbia committing atrocities with one another. In this case here, we have the Amici massacre. This appears to be ethnic cleansing taking place and it was a large event. Um, in fact, it was, it's supposed to be the largest event of the Bosnian War, uh, the Bosnian-Croat War, uh, where 120 uh, people were murdered. Operation Flash in 1995, where the Croats were set to take Slavonia, not Slovenia, but Slavonia. Slavonia had been renamed the RSK, Serbian Krajina. Krajina spelled K-R-A-J-I-N-A. -A. So... That, that move for autonomy had been at least temporarily realized where the Serbs created a whole new republic, the RSK. It was a pseudo uh, proto-state. And of course, the, uh, the Croats responded. And so what that ended up leading to actually in, in, the, in the skirmishes that followed was the Croatian Serbs, who were now autonomous, they actually shelled and detained United Nations personnel during this, this also known as the Croatian War for Independence. So the United Nations is now physically involved in the war and um, they are facing casualties and even prisoners of war. That's Operation Flash. Operation Storm um, is actually the last battle of the Croatian War for Independence. And it plays a huge role in another war called the Bosnian War. This is when I mentioned in Slovenia, um, people being driven out. In this case here, um, we have Serbs who were living in uh, Croatia and they're forced into Bosnia. So we mentioned displacement and it being a, uh, a war crime depending on intent. In 1995, Bosnian Serbs um, launch a mortar attack on Sarajevo, and that kills 37 civilians. That is war crimes, and it is followed two days later by NATO and other forces um, firing on military targets in that, in that uh, RSK, the, the 
the Republic of Serbian Grajina. So it's bringing up the question of the United Nations and their role. Um, they were able to they were able to create that ceasefire through diplomacy, so that was effective. But their protection forces thus far in Croatia have been fired on, have been detained. All right, so we've taken a, a short foray into Slovenia and Croatia. I think we should step back even a little bit further. Look at Yugoslavia as a whole, the whole entity that we see right here. Um, and we'll, we'll see um, its demise. And we'll see a lot about how the, how the uh, United Nations and, and what their role was, some of the results that came from that, and then um, some possibilities for activities. So we'll do that because after that, we're going to get into kind of the big boys, Serbia, Kosovo, Bosnia, which is a huge one as well. Um, and then I think what we'll do is then touch on... Um, Macedonia and Montenegro, because Serbia, Kosovo, and Bosnia are, are substantial. So let's touch on Yugoslavia. So we're in the early 1990s. We've seen Slovenia and Croatia now declare independence. In April of 1992, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia ended. The Federal Republic of Yugoslavia was formed but it was formed entirely, it was comprised entirely of Serbia and Montenegro. So we have a new Yugoslavia. It's those two eventual uh, countries that will, at least for now, form Yugoslavia. A month after that, the United Nations actually imposed sanctions on Serbia and Montenegro. So the United Nations, we said, you know, are they, are they an effective protection force? Are they, are they, uh, effective, maybe better off suited as a uh, as a, a diplomatic political structure that applies resolutions and agreements and uses diplomacy, or or and or uh, are they suit are they best suited for um, for delivering justice at the end? Of Here's a positive: in 1993, the United Nations actually set up the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And that was, they start, They began now to do that post-event research, looking for violations of international law and humanitarian law. This is a strength. This is where they come in and they really, and they're really effective. So the United, speaking of strong, the United Nations was strongly involved in Yugoslavia um, in 1995. Well, we talked about the U.S. lifting um, the United States lifted its, uh, its arms embargo. Then the United Nations actually increased its United Nations protection forces up about um, between 12 and 13,000. Um, they attempted to do arms, uh, set up arms collection points where they could get weaponry out of the hands of civilians, paramilitary and military people. Um, NATO actually delivered airstrikes uh, against the Bosnian Serbs. The United Nations headquarters was actually shelled by the Bosnian Serbs. And uh, a UN convoy, again, was fired upon with, uh, with return fire. So this was an, an actual skirmish. Because it's a skirmish involving the United Nations, therefore an organization doing, uh, performing a humanitarian effort, it's not, that's not just war. That's not just a skirmish. That is still a war crime. So the Bosnian Serbs shelling and firing on the United Nations, even though they received a fire, a fire in return, is still considered a war crime. And it was against the United Nations. The International Criminal, Criminal Tribunal indicted um, Karadzic, K-A-R-A-D-I-C, and Mladic for genocide. This is in 1995, and they're delivering this. And they also um, indicted Martic for war crimes. So they were, they were doling these, um, these indictments out as, as war continued. A meeting in Geneva resulted in Bosnia, Herzegovina, continuing to exist within these borders. And 
with international recognition. And it would consist of two entities. So we're gonna see, um, if, I don't know if I mentioned other things, OBLAST and OBLAST and SAP, Socialist Autonomous Provinces. We'll see that with Serbia coming up. So the idea of a country with semi-autonomous entities within it um, is, is what we're talking about here uh, with Bosnia and Herzegovina consisting of um, two entities. Since we're talking Yugoslavia as a whole, and I've mentioned World War I a whole bunch of times, I think an obvious activity would be maybe to select one of these countries and look at its, its World War II situation and link it to, to the situation in these 80s, mostly 90s and 2000s as well. So you could look at Croatia, for example, look at events that took place during, during World War II, during the occupation, during their resistance, and then through what we're just looking at it with the early, early 1990s. Additionally, or separately, you could actually link the end of World War I and the formation of Yugoslavia to World War II, and then all the way up to the 19... 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So you could actually link three completely separate significant periods of history, World War I, World War II, and then this Balkan War period together. Um, and it could just be done, it could be done really simply with bullet points, but I think you would see a lot of similarities. I mentioned about these historical um, feuds that existed, the animus that existed, especially Croatia and Serbia, Serbia and Slovenia, Serbia and, and, and Bosnia as well. Um, a lot of that, uh, that ancient and historic feuding, you can see link from World War I to II to up to the 90s and 2000s. Another activity idea, um, since we're talking Yugoslavia as a whole, would be what I touched on, I think, at the beginning, which was Marshal Tito and his personage, his personality. And that's the idea of a cult of personality. It seems like that's what held Yugoslavia together. It was so diverse, but diverse with that history of hatred that only the strength of Tito held it together. And it was through his application of the cult of personality um, that seemed to, hold, seemed to hold the country together. Because we saw them the moment he passed, the chinks in the armor of what was Yugoslavia began to show. There's an activity that's located in the file, and it's based actually on a song by a rock band from the 1980s, 1990s, probably 19, 1980s, called Living Color. I think students might like it. I've got a link to the YouTube, the official YouTube video. It's a clean video. There's nothing crazy in it. Um, it's the band playing in concert, and then it's the band playing on stage for the video recording. Uh, it's interesting because it's an all black band playing rock music. So I think that might be kind of maybe a little jarring for, for some of the students to see. And I think in a good way, it's a good song. Good is in the eye of the beholder, but I think it's a very catchy song. I think it was their most popular hit. The lyrics list people who demonstrated this, the strength of their personality, as do the images. In the image, you see Martin Luther King. Through the strength of his personality, he was able to make huge changes. In the lyrics, so was Stalin. And in the lyrics, so was Gandhi. So you look at this idea of these individuals and the utter strength of their personality and how it can do major things. It can create movements like Martin Luther King. It can um, attempt to dominate the world and, and spread communism like Stalin. It can pursue peace like Gandhi and, and on and on. So uh, looking at the lyrics after looking at the song and hearing the song, I think uh, and some activity. Um, so here, here is, this is located in the file, the session five folder, but you know, along with the lyrics and hearing the song, you can identify, you can have the students identify the people who are in the lyrics and in the video as well. They can, based on the song, the video, and the lyrics, they can determine what is a cult of personality. Maybe they should listen and do it, then listen and view the video and do it, and then look at the lyrics and do it. And I think they may be able to slowly but surely develop a, a good concept of what cult of personality means. Then they can actually look, at, look it up 
I look up definitions and, and uh, internet sources to, to really broaden the term. Then very, I think, interestingly, they can identify other people who would also be representative of this idea of the cult of personality. They could do it throughout history, you could develop whatever, or you could apply whatever parameters you wanted, as long as they support, they support the names with some sort of evidence. Then they can look at the question, does this idea, the cult of personality, depend on one's perspective? In other words, is one person's idea of the cult of personality opposite of another's? Or probably more where I'm going with this is the cult of personality of a person is there, but then is it a positive or is it a negative thing? So that's just an opinion. But I think this activity based around something kind of fun, um, a, a rock song that's catchy with a cool band, I think might be appealing uh, to students. All right, well, th this actually takes us, since we're in 1995, and it takes us to, of all places, Dayton, Ohio. It brings us from where we've been in the Balkans to Dayton, Ohio, where numerous parties met um, to kind of hammer out, as they say, to hammer out uh, a piece, or at least at least some sort of resolution. Now, another, I mentioned activities. Uh, we just did the cult of personality one and looking at links from World War I to two to three. <clears throat> another thing, another simple, I think, simple thing, kind of identifying, uh, an identifying activity would be just to like something like name that war. It sounds silly, but within the Balkans wars um, were the 10 day war, the Croatian war of independence, um, the 10 day war also known as the Slovenian war of independence the Bosnian War, and depending on one's perspective, like the U.S. Civil War is called the U.S. Civil War, the war between the states. It's also known by, by people with an affinity for the South, the Confederacy, as the War of Northern Aggression. There's also a, there's also a take on um, one of the wars, the, the Bosnian, Croatian, or 10-day war, that's considered a war of aggression as well. Depends on one's perspective. So maybe naming the wars, giving out, giving dates of when they took place, who fought who, um, and and for the students to see that a war, depending on your your side, can be called you know the, the glorious war or the war of aggression, depending on perspective. Um, naming important people, of course, is 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 certainly helpful. Most of these where names become prominent are they're Serbs for whatever reason. So I mentioned Slobodan Milosevic, Ratko Mladic. Radovan Karazdic, um, or Karazdic, I'm not sure, Radovan Karazdic, identifying who they are, um, what they did, especially their connection to genocide, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing. And, and we'll see that as, this, as we start to actually flesh this thing out a little bit. All right, so we're talking, um, I think we were in 1995 in Dayton, but I want to step back actually 10 years. Um, in 1985, Serbian political independence movements started to gain a presence as well. They were claiming, claiming that it's not independence due to, it's not really independence due to the formation of these SAPs, these Socialist Autonomous Provinces, of which there were two. One was the SAP of Kosovo, and another was the, S -O, the SAP of Bovidna. We'll see those two SAPs come up shortly and, and what that means for Serbia, because it's actually really important. Now, I mentioned uh, Slobodan Milosevic. In May of 86, he was elected to the presidency of the communists of Serbia. There was actually Serbian infighting within the leadership between leadership's communist branch and Milosevic's communist branch. Um, Serbian academics demanded the Serbian Autonomous Oblast, which is an administrative region in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So they are really, Serbia here is really starting to, just like Slovenia and Croatia, they're starting to, to express a desired change post-Tito, but where Slovenia and Croatia wanted independence away from Yugoslavia, it seems like Serbia is wanting to claim lands that they probably considered territories that, that were theirs in a, in a sense of reclamation and, a, and or expansion. So a little bit different between Slovenia, Croatia, and Serbia. In October of 1988, there was a, a protest in the SAP of Vovdinia. Um, 
and it was against the provincial government. The next day, Milosevic and 100,000 men marched into a town called Novi Sad. I bring this, the name of this town up because we saw this in session four. This was the town where 4,000 Jews and 6,000 Serbs were killed in 1942. This was the area, if you, if you did session four, that I, I referenced the, the, if you extended the area out, the outskirts, it was actually as high as possibly 15,000 people who were murdered by the Hungarians. Anyway, so these, this 100,000 men marched into Novi Sad to support anti-government protests. That forced the parliament to resign, which was replaced by, by people who were supporting Milosevic. That actually gave Serbia two of Yugoslavia's eight votes in total. And we'll see, we'll see that those votes increase. So you can understand um, as Serbia acquired more and more votes, how there would be a resentment against them because Serbia would be able to control all of Yugoslavia. In March of 89, Serbia changed their constitution, which left the SAP of Kosovo and Vodinia um, with no autonomy. Uh, Milosevic became the president of Serbia now officially, not the League of Communists, but the country itself of Serbia in 89. And on New Year's Eve of 1989, they, Milosevic actually ordered Serbia to stop sending electricity to Croatia. It's definitely a crime against humanity. And depending on the intent could be um, ethnic cleansing, but it certainly sounds like um, it was done. The goal was to inflict some sort of damage on Croatians. This is way back in 1989. A year later, the Democratic Party was founded in Serbia. 50,000 Serbs from Croatia and Serbia protested. And what they did was fascinating. Here's a link to World War II. They actually linked the party, the Croatian party that I mentioned, the HDZ, with the Ustasi from World War II. And they did that in order to preserve kind of the territorial integrity of Yugoslavia. But what's interesting is that connection. They're bringing up this old imagery of the Ustasi. You wonder if that will be used again in the future. Um, we've seen that with the Holocaust, where we've seen negative imagery of Jews and uh, portrayed in the Middle East. So those kind of historical images um, are, are resurrected when they're, when they're desired, and typically they're desired for the wrong reasons. So that's the case with linking the HDZ with the Ustasi. In March of 1990, Serbs near a Croatian seaside town established nightly checkpoints. So this is once again like the, um, the barricades and the roadblocks. Now we have checkpoints set up. A few days later, Serbian leaders met and agreed that war in both Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina was inevitable. So Serbia was preparing not to get themselves out of Yugoslavia via independence, but to go to war and expand, it sounds like. A few days after that, political tensions between Serbia and Croatia kind of started to explode. The Serbian newspaper actually rewrote the boundary of the country. Um, so, we'll, so it was no longer along um, the Drina River. Just like, some of the, just like Slovenia and Croatia, in September of 1990, the Serbs also removed the word socialist from the name of their country. Now it was just the Republic of Serbia. The end of September and into the beginning of October of 1990, Serbs declared autonomy in Croatia, right? We knew that, but they also declared uh, autonomy throughout the territory that was still then called Yugoslavia. Serbs were truly declaring autonomy or independence from Yugoslavia. Um, Milosevic asked for military action directly against Croatia in any other territory where Serbs were the majority. Um, interesting quote from, from Slobodan Milosevic. In March of 1990, he declared, quote, Yugoslavia does not exist anymore, end quote. That was followed by armed conflict between Serbs and Croats and the death, the first death of the Yugoslavian Wars, which we said was a Croat killed by a Serb. 
Um, violence and skirmishes throughout 1990 escalated. Um, tensions rose. Demonstrations occurred. In terms of more, um, more poignant and impactful quotes, in October of 1991, a Bosnian Serb politician said, quote, in just a couple of days, Sarajevo will be gone and there will be 500,000 dead. In one month, Muslims will be annihilated in Bosnia and Herzegovina, he went on to say. In the first place, no one of their leadership, that is the Bosniaks, would stay alive. In three, four hours, they'd all be killed. They wouldn't have a chance to survive at all. Bosniaks are, are Muslims, uh, Bosnian Muslims. We, we talked about in 1995, the International Criminal, Criminal Tribunal indicting different people, in this case here, it indicted 21 Serbs for genocide. All right, so that, that kind of concludes probably a, too long of an intro of Slovenia, Croatia, and Serbia, the, the kind of the, the heavy hitters so far. But now we're going to get into Kosovo and then Bosnia. And this is where we see the, um, the real focus. This is where we see the uh, genocide and the, um, the other mass human rights violations taking place. So that's where we're going to go next. All right, we have um, the death of Tito in uh, May of 1980, and that pressure for independence that we saw in Slovenia and Croatia. Um, we see the same thing with Kosovo, uh, of the Kosovo province, and it was growing within the Kosovar Albanian population who felt that the Serb authorities discriminated against them. So once again, Serbia is kind of our linchpin looking at. Serbia did not permit uh, Kosovar Albanian to be taught in the schools. There was no uh, Kosovar Albanian representation in the Serbian parliament. So in a way, the Serbs were right. I mean, this is, they're being discriminated against. Uh, rather, the Kosovar Albanians were correct that they were being discriminated against. And in a way, not teaching a language is killing the language, which is killing part of the culture. That's something we see, see today in China, where um, in Mongolia, where they're trying to kill that language as well. The tensions and the protests begin, like it did in, in Slovenia, with, uh, with students. So this began in 1981. Again, only a year, not even quite a year after, uh, after Tito's death. In April, there were mass demonstrations of Albanians from Albania in Kosovo. They wanted the SAP, the Socialist Autonomous Province of Kosovo, the autonomous region within Yugoslavia, but it was still a province of Serbia. They wanted it to become a component, for lack of a better term, of Yugoslavia as a whole, as opposed to Serbia. In other words, they were really looking for independence from Serbia. I think that's a, that's a fair way to put, to put it. Forces were sent there and a state of emergency was declared the next day, ending um, April the 3rd, nine dead and 250 injured. So we've, so we've got completely opposite that we had in Slovenia. We have almost instantaneous physical violence. Uh, Serbian Orthodox bishops sign a petition and it's regarding Serbian persecution in Kosovo, um, Kosovo Serbian residents claimed brutal crimes by Kosovo Albanians, those uh, Kosovars. So it's going back and forth. The tensions are rising, the, the Serbian side and the Albanian side, and they're focused in and living within Kosovo, and there's infighting there as well. Um, that issue is what causes a cry for nationalism in Serbia. So Slovenian nationalism, Croatian nationalism, and Serbian nationalism, all consistent across the board in this. A, um, a Kosovo Serbian, a resident there, claimed a brutal crime was convicted, um, a brutal crime was perpetrated by a Kosovo Albanian, a Kosovar. That issue alone caused a cry for nationalism in Serbia. Slobodan Milosevic, 
delivered a speech to 15,000 Serbs and Montenegrins. It was later aired on television. The president at the time, the current president, Ivan Stambolic, um, saw that on television and he said, quote, um, and he said that he had seen, quote, the end of Yugoslavia, end quote. Milosevic went on to defeat Stambolic, who ended up resigning leadership of the League of Communists of Serbia. Milosevic is, is uh, consolidating his power. Kosovo Serbs and Montenegrins protest outside of the Serbian capital of Belgrade against persecution by ethnic Albanians. So the Albanians are getting uh, the blame here in this region from Serbs and from Montenegrins. In November of 1988, the Kosovo provincial government resigned completely, replaced by Milosevic uh, supporters. Ethnic Albanians uh, demonstrated in response. And what this did was now it gave Serbia three of Yugoslavia's eight votes. The day after that, one million people rallied to support uh, Milosevic, to, to demonstrate that support of Milosevic. The next day, 100,000 ethnic Albanians marched through the Kosovo capital. Political tensions rising. A state of emergency was declared in Kosovo because of the Albanian protests. Western leaders feared that the Serbs were actually getting ready to ethnically cleanse Kosovo as Kosovo sought independence. So when a passive resistance movement here in the you know, late 80s, early 90s um, attempts to become independent um, and it fails, you either stop seeking independence or you choose an alternate path. An alternate path would be some sort of uh, rebellion, a rebel movement, which was what happened and what was called the Kosovo Liberation Army, the KLA. So they could no longer uh, attempt diplomacy and, or political means to secure independence. Now they had to change, uh, change their, their acts of resistance to, to physical. And so they began to attack Serbian targets in the mid-1990s. Now the Serbian forces had actually begun ethnically cleansing um, through forced displacement of people um, and it was a ca an actual campaign and it displaced, it pushed out of Kosovo, the Albanian, the Kosovo Albanians. And they actually employed here genocide, genocidal massacres of entire villages as a means of terror, a terror tactic. And it ended up actually driving out 800,000 Kosovars into Albania, ethnic cleansing, genocide, war crime, crimes against humanity. And this event here in Kosovo encapsulates all four. In 1989, the Democratic League of Kosovo was formed. In January of 1990, about 40,000 Albanian protesters gathered in Kosovo and they were dispersed via water cannons and tear gas. Absolutely not supportive of democracy. In January, the end of January, there was a general strike in Kosovo. And on the 31st, Yugoslavia sent troops in to restore order. Again, the troops would be the JNA, the Yugoslav National Army, which was uh, predominantly Serbian. In March of 1990, something happened interesting. It's a, it's a student poisoning an alleged student poisoning that took place, depending on who is telling the story. Um, it's undeter it was undetermined if it was poison gas and if, if it were poison gas, was it delivered intentionally by someone? In other words, the Kosovo, Kosovars would have claimed that the Serbs delivered this intentionally. The Serbs said it was mass hysteria. It was acting, in other words, it was kind of like the Salem witch trials where we saw the Salem witches um, mass hysteria. In April, the Croatian police were removed from Kosovo. In July, Kosovo declared independence. This is July of 1990. They declared independence. 
Albanians then began a, a general strike. And the response by September of 1990 by the Serbs was a massacre in a village in Kosovo. Their vote for independence a year later, almost to the day, September 30 of 1991, their vote for independence was, was simply denied by Serbia. So in 1999, NATO decided to intervene and they actually began bombing Serbia. After the Serbian army was driven out of Kosovo, NATO and the United Nations took over the administration of Kosovo in 1999. Kosovo's ethnic Albanians fought Serbs in a war for independence and Serbia actually ended up leaving uh, the conflict beaten and essentially alone in this mass of what was called Yugoslavia. A treaty was signed in 1999 with the withdrawal of the Serbian, <clears throat> of the Serbian army from Kosovo. The International Criminal uh, Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia charged Milosevic with genocide and other crimes against humanity. In March 2006, after a four-year trial, Milosevic was actually found dead in his cell from a heart attack. There were subsequent trials for uh, crimes against humanity, war crimes um, that have been heard since in international courts, which were established in, uh, in Kosovo. In 2008, so now we're only 12 years since, uh, since this happened. In 2008, the Republic of Kosovo finally declared independence from Serbia and yet Serbia still refused to recognize uh, Kosovo independence. It's, it's still contested by Serbia today um, between the Albanian majority and the Serb minority that live there, that share that small country, um, the tensions are still very high. In, in fact, I referenced Genocide Watch earlier. Genocide Watch wrote a, a summary in, I think, in, this year in 2020 or last year, 2019. At that time, they said in present tense language that Kosovo was still deeply polarized between that Albanian majority and the Serb minority. Um, that the Serbs mainly live in the northern corner of the country. Well, doesn't that make sense in a way? They live up here near bordering Serbia. Uh, the Serbs still, not all, but many of the Serbs still hate the Kosovo Albanians because they consider that this territory was actually stolen from Serbia. The Albanians won't forget Serbia's atrocities committed by Milosevic. So there is still a strong sense of tension as of 2019. In the latest report the, um, of their international crisis group looked at the stability for this Northern part of Kosovo. In July of 2011, tensions flared up again in this area of Northern Kosovo. Um, uh, an area's police department and some local Serbs got into a conflict. This is once again about cust now, now we're calling them customs gates. Customs gates, blockades, roadblocks, etc. were set up along the border with Serbia. Um, Serbia refused to recognize Kosovo's sovereignty, especially in that area in the north. So according to Genocide Watch, because of the history of ethnic tension. This is that ancient history, this ongoing sense. Because of their history of ethnic tensions and the current risk for further conflict, Genocide Watch considers Kosovo to be at stage five, which is polarization. Now to focus on Bosnia, Bosnia-Herzegovina. This obviously involves Bosniaks, who we said are Bosnian Muslims. It involves Serbs and it involves Croats. We showed the order in terms of declarations of independence. Slovenia was first, Croatia next, and Bosnia heading directly south. This declaration was opposed by Bosnian Serbs. Serbs. A, um, a prominent Muslim author was arrested by communists and he was tried in Sarajevo way back in 1983. He was writing about a Muslim renaissance. He was sentenced for 14 years and spent nearly six years uh, behind bars. This is a man who 
we would see again. Um, the Bosnian Serb leader, a name I mentioned earlier, I believe, Radovan Karazdik, threatened bloodshed if Bosniaks and Croats broke away. But breaking away was acknowledged and okayed by Europe in a 1992 referendum. Yugoslav army units were withdrawn from Croatia and they were actually named Bosnian Serb Army. The country was renamed the Socialist Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. This is actually the first time they, with the addition of the word socialist as opposed to the removal of it. About 1 million Bosniaks and Croats end up driven from their homes in an ethnic cleansing. The number ranges from 100,000 to 1 million of non-Serbs who were driven from their home with the intention being ethnic cleansing. That was in an attempt to make Bosnia and Croatia Serbian states, again, going back to the World War II and historic animosity between Serbs and neighbors. Anyway, we're, so looking at dates, we're back, like all the others, we're back in 1990. Now, I referenced this meeting several times, but there was the meeting, the League of Communists of Yugoslavia was held without members from Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, Slovenia, and Macedonia. But this is that meeting that excluded all those people and that included uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina. A, uh, a Bosnian conservative party, political party was established, the SDA. The idea of the removal of Bosniaks was intended to create a greater Serbia. Sarajevo was besieged and shelled during a three year unrelenting campaign that took 10,000 lives. Sarajevo was cut off from food and from medical supplies. And its streets became like the Wild West. And there were areas where snipers were targeting Bosniak civilians. So they were in the mountains and the surrounding hills and they were actually targeting in Sarajevo uh, looking for Bosniak civilians to intentionally kill them. So war crimes, for sure, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing. This is this is big. Uh, there's a there's a thing called the Mark Markale Market Massacres, which were committed by Serbian forces against civilians during the siege. People were killed indiscriminately. They were sniped. Uh, the Bosnian War. If you think about this whole this whole event, there were mass killings. There were mass rapes. There was torture. There was, again, displacement of people. Um, at least 100,000 people were killed during the war, and most of them were Bosniaks. So this pits Bosniaks and Bosniaks and Croats versus Bosnian Serbs, still within the same, the same country. This took place mostly in the extremes of, uh, of the country, so the most eastern and the most western extremes. Um, Serbian militias fought to deny Bosnian independence and or to eradicate Bosniaks from the area, which is, which is absolutely um, ethnic cleansing. So safe areas were established for Bosniak civilians to be protected from Serbian militias. militias. This is what's getting us to the Srebrenica. Now, when that is the name of the town the killings that take place were in an extended area around that, but that's that's the name that is used as Srebrenica. This harkens back to that activity idea of the effectiveness of UN protection forces. Bosniak civilians went to UN, a United Nations base looking for refuge. This is in July of 1995. The base was guarded by an admittedly small force of 600, quote, lightly armed Dutch UN soldiers leads to what is considered the worst massacre in Europe since World War II. Uh, Ratko Mladic, a Serb, oversaw an enormous army of 180,000 men. Uh, he somehow managed to convince or demand, it depends on again who, who writes, the, who's writing the, uh, the history, he either convinced or he demanded 
that the United Nations Forces Dutch commander, whose name was Colonel Tom Karamans, he demanded that the, or, or convinced him that the Bosniaks be disarmed and to allow them to separate the men from the women and children. Some of the men and uh, some of the women and children were actually taken out of the lines to be raped. Others were tortured. Uh, and for whatever reason, the Dutch soldiers didn't take any action. Later, uh, former, now former Secretary General, or General Secretary rather, Kofi Annan uh, said, quote, the tragedy of Srebrenica will forever haunt the history of the United Nations, end quote. Again, adding to that idea of foreign activity, any forceful action required approval from the United Nations chief of the mission. Um, and he kept, for whatever reason, shooting down requests because his preference was negotiation. He didn't authorize airstrikes against the Serbian snipers in the, in the surrounding hills. And that in part ends up leading to the Srebrenica genocide. 23,000 women and children deported to Bosniak force controlled areas. And somewhere between 7,000 and around 8,400 males, Bosniak males, as young as 12 and on up, 12 to 77 is the age range that's given. And the males were massacred. Now at the time, Mladic was probably in Belgrade while most of the killings took place in Srebrenica and the, and the area. So he probably wasn't in communications with them, but perhaps had given the order upon leaving to, to kill, um, to cleanse, to uh, liquidate. We don't know. We don't know what the, what the order was. And this is reminiscent of the second uh, session we did on Cambodia, where General Lan Nau, uh, who was, was before um, Pol Pot, he was in Phnom Penh um, while uh, massacres were taking place. So in a way it gives you, it gives you the, it gives one the um, excuse that I wasn't there. So how could I have been involved? There was either a direct order or an understanding. And so, um, so Mladic, we will see how he's treated for this. Again, not picking on the Dutch, but the Dutch UN forces ended up handing over 5,000 people who'd been sheltering in exchange for 14 Dutch UN um, protection force soldiers who were being held prisoner. So they traded 5,000 Bosniaks for the 14 Dutch UN protection force uh, prisoners. This massacre took place over a, uh, a five to 10 day, depending on the source uh, period. And it included machine gunnings of groups of people, so groups of 10. Um, and then they were plowed into mass burials. Obviously, all this that we're talking about when we're referring to Srebrenica is genocide. Mladic is thinking, why? Where is, this, where is this coming from? You know, we've looked at the map. And so we know that there's territorial issues. We know that there's religious issues, linguistic issues, et cetera. But what was, what was the rationale for it? It was, at least in Mladic's thinking, he connected early Turkish occupation to that of the Bosniak. So in other words, they were Muslim, whether it was the Ottoman Empire or whether it was uh, Bosniaks in Bosnia, Herzegovina in the 1990s, they were all um, Turks. He used that, that word as an insult. It was intended to be an insult. Um, Mladic's father, had died while fighting the Ustasi in Croatia and had grown up under Tito. So you can see that there was, there was probably that uh, sense, that upbringing. The Srebrenica genocide finally mobilized NATO, which bombed uh, Bosnian Serb forces and Belgrade. After several airstrikes, Bosnian Serb and Serbian leaders agreed to peace talks. So this is where we get that talk in uh, Dayton, Dayton, Ohio. The Dayton Peace Agreement, as it's called, 
was signed in November of 1995, and it officially ended the Bosnian War. Now, the Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina was one of the most ethnically, one of the most religiously diverse areas uh, within Yugoslavia. So that goes back to that activity, that, that diversity being our strength and having students argue the opposite. Diversity is not our strength. Well, here's an area that was incredibly diverse um, and should have demonstrated that strength instead of that animosity. According to the uh, 1991 census, the population included, and so you can see the breakdown here, by the way, you can see the, the pockets and the areas. It included uh, about 43% Bosniaks. And you can see where they're the green, where, they're, where they lived at the time. So 43% Bosniaks, about 31% Serbs, and then a small um, 17 or so percent of Croats and then other uh, minorities. So predominantly Bosniak and then um, Serbian. January 9 of 1992, Bosnian Serbs declared an autonomous Serbian region within Bosnia-Herzegovina. This was later named the Republic of Srpska, S-R-P-S-K-A. So once again, we have these, these autonomous oblasts, these administrative regions, these socialist autonomous provinces. Well, here's another, the Republic of Srpska. Bosnia-Herzegovina held a, a, an, a referendum on independence. Uh, Bosniaks, Bosniaks and Croats voted overwhelmingly for independence from Yugoslavia, just like everyone else following suit, the Slovenes and the Croats. Now you have uh, the Bosnia-Herzegovina, at least the Croats and the Bosniaks living there saying, yes, we want independence. Independence from whom or from what? From the country of Yugoslavia. However, the Bosnian Serbs boycotted the vote because they wanted to remain within Serb-dominated Yugoslavia. However, March 3rd, 1992, the Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina declared its independence from, uh, from Yugoslavia. And it was formally recognized by the United States and other European nations in, in 1992. Well, in 1992, there was the shelling of Sarajevo underway in which a man yelled, burn their brains and shell them until they're on the edge of madness. April of 1994, Bosnian Serbs were bombed by NATO. A ceasefire followed, and um, there were talks between combatants over the next handful of days. There were various agreements, foreign interventions, endorsements, and so forth. About four or so months later, Slobodan Milosevic decided to sever ties with Bosnian Serbs since they had rejected a peace plan. November 21st, 1994, NATO bombed an airport year used by Serbs and then followed it up with intense diplomatic and further military actions. Um, Milosevic ended up going into hiding in 1995 and lived in obscurity. Um, he was protected by family and security forces and was eventually arrested in 2011. He was the president and he was offered kind of a, a tacit protection and actually was, was able to travel um, unmolested at, at restaurants at soccer games and other events. So he was kind of hidden in plain sight. When he lost power in 2000, that led eventually to the arrest of Mladic and that left Milosevic more um, unprotected. Back in 1995, he had been indicted by the United Nations for genocide. That was for that siege of Sarajevo and also for Srebrenica. So two different, completely different things he was indicted for. Um, now, to keep in mind, Croats and Bosniaks were also accused of war crimes. So it wasn't one-sided. Siege of Sarajevo, uh, Bosnia's capital, lasted from 1992 to 1995. The death toll was 10,000. And it was what prosecutors ended up calling a Serbian, quote, criminal enterprise, end quote, designed to spread terror and drive inhabitants from the area. So that's that um, idea of uh, crimes against humanity and war crimes and ethnic cleansing, pushing people out and 
in, in a sense to ethnically cleanse an area. In 2004, some of Mladic's aides begin, began to uh, surrender uh, for war crimes tribunals. And Mladic was actually, actually put on trial at the International Criminal Court for Yugoslavia, located in The Hague. That was in 2012, so not that long ago from here. Not that long ago from where we are. He was sentenced to life in jail, and then he was finally jailed in 2017. Um, back in 2016, Bosnian Serb political leader Radovan Karazdic was found guilty of war crimes, and he was sentenced to 40 years. He was convicted on 10 counts, and because they found that he, quote, significantly contributed, end quote, to the genocide in Srebrenica, and other charges as well, which included crimes against humanity, um, although he was cleared of the second count of genocide in other counties. The International Criminal Court for Yugoslavia and the International Court of Justice determined that the massacre was in fact genocide. U.S. attempts to quell what we call uh, Srebrenica, the genocide, um, were, they were ineffective and they ended up leaving 100,000 dead. So that fits in again with that activity. Um, Bosnian Serbs attacked Srebrenica. UN forces either surrendered the area or they retreated. NATO stepped in and ended up bombing uh, Bosnian Serbs. Uh, the United States actually helped broker the, the peace deal that divided Bosnia into um, self-governing entities. The Bosnian Serb Republic, Bosnian Serb Republic and the Muslim Croat Federation. In 2002, a report blamed the Dutch. So this is about the Dutch role in what became the genocide at Srebrenica. The 2002 report blamed the Dutch government and military officials. In fact, the whole Dutch government resigned because of that. And only two years ago, one and a half years ago, in 2019, the, the Dutch Supreme Court upheld a ruling that stated that the Netherlands was partially responsible for the deaths of, it, of 350 of those killed in Srebrenica. Um, now, Serbia, for their, for their role, uh, has apologized for the crime, but they do not acknowledge that it was genocide. In January, January 9 of 1992, Bosnian Serbs established their own republic. Wherever Serbians lived in Bosnia or Herzegovina and where they were the majority, and quote, and all other regions where the Serbian people represent a minority due to the Second World War genocide, end quote. So you can see that the Serbs were, Bosnian Serbs and Serbs were still holding on to that World War II animus. In February, a referendum, in February of 1992, a referendum was held on independence in Bosnia with a majority of those Muslims, Bosniaks and Croats voting yes, but again, the Serbs boycotted the vote. The next day, a Serb was killed by a Bosniak at a wedding in a horrific, violent, vicious crime. And that results in the first casualty of the Bosnian War. In March 92, Bosnia and Herzegovina declare independence. In April, the fighting kicked off in Bosnia and Herzegovina between the Bosniaks and the Croats. And the JNA, the Yugoslavian National Army, and the Serbian paramilitary. In September of 92, those United Nations Protection Forces expanded in Bosnia, Bosnia-Herzegovina. And on October 9th of 1992, the United Nations established a no-fly zone over Bosnia for all military flights. So there's a, there's, a, there's a plus for the United Nations and the Protection Forces. In May of 1993, the Bosnian capital, Sarajevo, was declared a safe zone by the United Nations. February 9th, NATO was authorized to bomb the areas around Sarajevo, trying to uh, initiate a ceasefire through, through strength. I mentioned Genocide Watch, um, their take on how Kosovo was since and up to almost to almost present. Uh, same with Bosnia-Herzegovina. According to Genocide Watch, Bosnian Serbs engaged in a cover-up attempt after the genocide. 
Um, they used reburials. They'd move, they'd move bodies around to, to rebury them and hide, uh, hide DNA evidence now. International Commission on Missing Persons has used DNA analysis to identify remains and inform families. Every year on the 11th, July 11th, there's a commemoration that's held at the Srebrenica Genocide Memorial um, where remains are interred. Uh, the, main, the main architects, if you will, of the Srebrenica Genocide, Milosevic, Karadzic, and Mladic were captured and they were prosecuted for genocide and crimes against humanity by that international criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. However, genocide denial continues. And because of that, there is still, that's just another layer, another addition to keep that rift, that animosity between peoples. And that is the case in Bosnia Herzegovina. To this day, there are deniers, and that, of course, connects directly with the Holocaust, Holocaust denial, whether it's denial that the event occurred in totality or if it was lessened somehow, if it wasn't as bad as. Well, the same thing exists here in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and we see the results, the graves, the impromptu, possible secondary or even tertiary graves um, to, hide, to hide remains. Genocide deniers still exist. People who were in that Republic of Republika Srpska and Serbia actually, they don't deny that something took place. They do not accept the term genocide and they downplay the numbers as well. Um, they actually accuse the uh, International uh, Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the United Nations of um, of bias against the Serbs. So it's, it's difficult to reconcile when, when there's when there's denial going on of what took place. Because there is genocide denial, which is stage 10, Bosnia-Herzegovina certainly has a stage 10. But as I said in the first session, which introduced the terms, um, the, the United Nations terms of genocide and the three major uh, mass human rights violations, we also kind of went in a little bit more in depth to the 10 stages of genocide because there is a stage 10, it does not mean that's the end. There is stage 10 in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and that is denial, but there's also, just like we saw in Kosovo, there's still polarization. So you can see stage six, polarization, stage 10, denial, how they actually work in unison. This is the result we have. Mothers mourning their children, wives mourning their husbands. This is the reality. The areas of Macedonia and Montenegro. Um, included violence towards civilians in uh, Macedonia. Uh, a meeting in March of, uh, March of 1990. Again, it was the meeting of the League of Communists of Yugoslavia and Macedonians were excluded as well, along with people from Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, Slovenia, uh, they were excluded. So leaving what would become Yugoslavia, at least, at least temporarily, um, Serbia and Montenegro. Macedonia voted in September of 1990 for independence. And in December of 1991, the president of Macedonia wrote a letter that their independence be recognized by international foreign leaders. The immediate response for this request for independence is not necessarily from Yugoslavia. It wasn't even specifically from Serbia, but it was actually from Greece. Greece immediately responded with matching what they might have considered military provocation by um, moving troops to the to the Greece to the Greek Macedonian border. That's outside of Yugoslavia, outside of our purview for sure. But it just shows again Macedonia and Greece. Let's let's talk about really historic animosity. Um, and, and feuding and history between the two countries. So that was the response by Greece, Greece having its own issues going on at the time. Um, in fact, up to 1995, there was even a, an assassination attempt on the president of Macedonia. But we don't see in Macedonia um, the violence that we did see in Bosnia and Kosovo, Serbia, Croatia. Macedonia, like Slovenia, relatively stable despite despite saying that there was violence towards civilians, we don't see this, the level um, that merits 
really any of the, the four definitions from the United Nations genocide or the three mass human rights violations. Now Montenegro, and its affiliation with Serbia, there was um, there were actually protests in Tito Grad, um, which is now known as Podgorica. Um, so there were protests going on, and that was intervened by the Montenegrin police. And Serbia actually interpreted that as an act of hostility. So again, there was violence towards civilians here as well. When, when these wars happen, when civil wars happen, when revolutions happen, when occupations happen, it's civilians who, who we're discovering um, become um, expendable. They become collateral damage. In Jan as early as January of, 18, of, of 1989, 100,000 protesters gathered in Titograd, and that was against the current government. It actually forced members to resign the next day, and they were replaced by acolytes of Slobodan Milosevic. So now this gives Serbia essentially four of the eight votes at the time, four of the eight votes of Yugoslavia. In December of 1990, the League of Communists won the election in Montenegro. And in 2006, um, Montenegro voted for independence. And the federal, this brings about the end of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. They actually garnered recognition um, in July of 2006. So we can see that there is a range of different levels of violence that take place. But what we do see is the burgeoning desire to, for independence. But it seems like it's more than that. It seems like it's not just a desire for independence, but it is the dissolution of Yugoslavia, not because their dislike of Yugoslavia, but because of, again, who they're forced to be aligned with in Yugoslavia, Croats and Serbs, Serbs and Slovenes, et cetera. Now, this is something we've done for the previous three sessions that we did, uh, Cambodia, Mexico and the Mexican Revolution, and Yugoslavia in World War II. You can see them listed here. And what we're looking at is um, a name that I gave the event, approximate dates, the style or type of system of governance or political philosophy, how it would, how it would align with today's left-right paradigm. The idea being that we want to show that more than likely, both sides of the spectrum, both ends of the pole are represented, represented in terms of uh, genocides and mass human rights violations. Um, typically, the names of the, of the countries are changed, and we've certainly seen that. One of the things we have been looking at is the idea of totalitarianism as being more, as having more of an effect than if you call it communism or nationalism, patriotism or socialism, fascism or something else. Um, we see that totalitarianism has, at least along the way, been pretty, pretty prominent. So it was totalitarian when Hitler occupied Yugoslavia. It, it was with, the, with Pavlich and the Ustasi in Croatia. It was under Tito throughout Yugoslavia. In Mexico and the Mexican Revolution, totalitarianism, totalitarianism was there under Diaz, under Huerta, and Obregón. And you can see that, that Diaz was right. Huerta, somewhere in between. Obregón on the left. In Cambodia, we see totalitarianism pretty much across the board, whether it was someone from the right, like General Juan Nau, or someone from the left in Pol Pot or Heng Samrin. So if we look at, if, and, and typically what we've been looking at is that one country is controlled by a reign of power, and then it hands off to the next. This is different because of, it's almost like fiefdoms, um, individual countries within a major country. So we're not going to see the same kind of effect, but this tracker, we want to carry this all the way through. So we can see the different types of systems of governance or, or uh, systems of governance. 
and, and the event name. So for Slovenia, homogeneity. For Croatia, a powder keg. For Bosnia, Herzegovina, a Serbian genocide. For Kosovo, we see ethnic Albanians versus the Serbs. In Macedonia, we see that as, as being taken as a provocation for Greece. In Montenegro, we see that alliance with Serbia. <clears throat> and with Serbia, we see just a reviving of World War II animus. We see a range of dates, most of them at least starting as soon as, um, as Tito died, a lot in the early 90s and then, and then up into the mid 2000s. We see that we see, nas we see nationalism, ethnic nationalism, a constitutional republic and communist nationalism represented. So you see the full spectrum of left, moderate to right and right wing, um, all of those systems of governance um, or political philosophies, see them represented. We have been looking at the numbers of dead and it's been relatively easy to do thus far. Cambodia, 2.6 million. Throughout Mexico and the Mexican Revolution, 1.4 million. At least 1.6 million Yugoslavia during World War II. That doesn't include um, what followed between World War II and, and Tito's death when approximately a million plus died. It's really, really different here because again, you have a handful of countries, you have so much overlap and you don't have records that were kept. In Slovenia, um, we have mostly war deaths in that short lived 10 day war. In Croatia, a number that's accepted is 6,000 in terms of civilians. The number of Bosnia, Herzegovina, the big number of killed is by Serbia. We have 100,000 people killed. So the main thing we've been looking at really <clears throat> in regards to this chart or this tracker is was genocide perpetrated? Were crimes against humanity perpetrated? Were there war crimes and ethnic cleansing? Along the way, we've added two other columns, much less formal and much less maybe tangible. That is religious intolerance and lack of human respect. We've seen religious intolerance in Cambodia. We saw it in Mexico in the Mexican Revolution. Does it play a role in, in, in the events of the, these independence movements in the Balkans Wars and the former Yugoslavia? The last thing we noted was a lack of human respect. And we saw that in Cambodia, um, Mexico, Mexican Revolution as well. In general, you see that when we're talking about death, but there were specific, specific um, instances that really demonstrated a lack of respecting or valuing human life. Those play a role, but not as much as what we've talked about before the historical uh, animosities. Was genocide committed? Yes, in Srebrenica. Yes, by the Serbs. Crimes against humanity? Yes, in Croatia. Yes, in Bosnia, Herzegovina. And yes, by the Serbs. So if you look, you see that Serbia, for whatever reason, was involved in all of this. Genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, probably ethnic cleansing. There is most likely an element of religious intolerance because of their, the, one of the foundational reasons for their hatred with Croatia is the difference in religion. And then the last is uh, lack of respect for human life and in general, war, genocide leads to that. So what we did was a really high level overview where we looked at the countries that comprised what was Yugoslavia, and we saw their, um, their yearning for independence. We saw the dominoes fall with Slovenia, then Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and then eventually everyone pretty much declared independence except for Serbia. Serbia, who was the prominent power still in Yugoslavia, wanted to hold on to Yugoslavia, and it's understandable. We saw a... Uh, reviving of those animosities. We saw um, the potential for activities that I think could be of interest to students or could be beneficial to students. Again, one was to look at sports figures and um, musical artists and other types of artists and look at their role during these events from 1980 up till, up till recently in the Balkans um, and their how they, how they brought in, um, how they wove in politics into 
their sports and their music, see the effect of it. Is it effective? And then maybe compare it to what we talked about with ours, our contemporary sports, because we see that happening here. A second, of, a second activity was to look at the Slovenian spring and compare it to what is called the Arab spring. A third um, and obvious one is to, is to just draw linkages, say Croatia, World War I, World War II, and the Balkans Wars, pick Slovenia and do the same thing. Um, that, that would be a real easy one if you don't wanna go back as far as World War I, World War II to today. Um, that's an activity that I think would show, would demonstrate to students how relevant history is. Fourth was the, the one about diversity and, and having students actually flip that on its head. Diversity is not our strength and argue that point, whether they believe it or not, and they most likely don't. Um, looking at the cult of personality, with the music, the band, the lyrics, and the idea of looking into personalities who, historical personalities who have controlled uh, empires and countries through sheer force of their personality. And then, a, and then the last one is to, to take a, a, a real look at the United Nations and their different roles, military, military, diplomatic, or judicial. You could almost do a score sheet and see how they, how did they do in the Balkans wars or pick a country and see how they did. So as always, I wanna thank the Florida Task Force on, on Holocaust Education, thank them for their support and the Merrill Color uh, Educator Series, again, for their support, allowing us to do these teachers workshops. This um, will conclude session five on Yugoslavia and is effective, uh, will be available effective November 1, 2020. The next one after this is going to be on another controversial one is on our, the Armenian genocide um, and Turkey. So that will be the next one up. That will be available effective December 1st of 2020. Um, so if you would like to check out the session five folder, you'll see um, activities links. You'll also see a, um, a session attendance template. If you want to fill that out and email it back to me to let me know that you, that you attended this workshop, I would appreciate that. That we, we need to track that kind of information for the task force and the Merrill Color Educator Series. That would be very helpful and appreciated. Um, if you have questions, let me know. Email is sam at hmcec.org. Sam at hmcec.org. Uh, here at the Holocaust Museum and Cohen Education Center. Again, my name is Sam Parrish, and I want to thank you very much until we see you next time.